Hello everyone, welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. I'm Stephanie Valdez, the owner of the bookstore. Community Bookstore is celebrating 50 years in business and we credit the continued support of readers and writers for this milestone. Thank you for spending the evening with us. I'm thrilled today to welcome Allison Esbach for the release of Notes on Your Sudden Disappearance in conversation with Teddy Wayne. Allison used to live nearby and it's been at least a decade since we posted her, so it's a special pleasure for us. Now to some housekeeping, we've enabled Zoom's auto transcribe settings. If your version of Zoom is up to date, you could hit the live transcription button at the bottom of your screen to enable closed captions. If you have any questions for tonight's guests, please click on the Q&A button, which is also at the bottom of your screen to submit them. We'll be asking those at the end of the program, so please don't be shy. There's also a chat box through which I'll be posting a link to buy tonight's book if you haven't already. We also have a great lineup of events planned for you this spring, so you can head over to our website, communitybookstore.net, and sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date. So now a little bit about tonight's guests and we'll get started. Allison Esbach is the author of the novel, The Adults, a New York Times editor's choice and a Barnes & Noble Discover pick. Her short stories and essays have appeared in Vogue, Joyland, Glamour, Salon, and Mixed Weenies, among other places. She's currently a professor of creative writing at Providence College in Rhode Island. Teddy Wayne is the author of the novels, The Great Man Theory, Apartment, Loner, The Love Song of Johnny Valentine, and Capitoro. He is the winner of a Whiting Writers Award and an NEA Creative Writing Fellowship, as well as a finalist for the Young Lions Fiction Award, Penn Bingham Prize, and Dayton Literary Peace Prize. A former columnist for the New York Times and McSweeney's and a frequent contributor to the New Yorker, he has taught at Columbia University and Washington University in St. Louis. He has developed films and series from his novels with HBO, MGM Television, and Mad Dog Films. He lives in Brooklyn with his wife, the writer Kate Greathead, and their children. Please help me welcome Allison and Teddy. Hi, Ali. I'll, I'll, Hi. I'll hide my video while you do your reading, and then I'll come back on. Is that good? That sounds good. OK. Uh, so I'm. Uh, uh, thank you to Community, Community Bookstore uh, for having me. Uh, this is a real pleasure. Uh, you know, I've been trying to get back to Park Slope and the bookstore in person uh, post pandemic um, and haven't been able to. So this has really been um, a wonderful surprise to, to be able to at least Zoom with you all tonight. So um, I'm gonna start by just doing a short reading of uh, the opening to this novel, Notes on Your Sudden Disappearance. Um, and since it's the beginning of the novel, I don't think there really needs to be that much set up but I will just say that um, this book is told from the perspective of a young girl, Sally Holt, uh, who is writing in the, in the second person uh, directed at her deceased older sister. Um, and she is really telling the story or talking to her sister uh, from an adult, place in her life, uh, but so much of the opening uh, and the beginning of, of this novel really focuses on her um, early memories with, with her younger sister before she passed away. So <clears throat> uh, the section title is uh, The State of the Union, 1998. You disappeared on a school night. Nobody was more surprised by this than me. If I believed in anything when I was 13, I believed in the promise of school nights. I believed in the sacred ritual of homework, then dinner, and then the laying out of our clothes for the next morning, something mom insisted on from the very beginning. Mom said it was important to wake up, having made the decision about what to wear. So each night we made the decision. We brushed our teeth. We stared at each other in the mirror as the foam built and built in our mouths. And eventually one of us would speak, Hello, you'd say, and this would be so funny for some reason that I can't understand now. You would start laughing, a loud burst of confetti out your mouth. And so I would start laughing, an ugly inward sucking sound that always made mom run into a room and say, Sally, are you okay? Which made us laugh even harder. She's just laughing, mom, you said. 
We got into our beds. We stared up at the glow in the dark stars that were arranged on the ceiling to spell our names. An idea I hadn't liked at first, since I wanted the ceiling to be an accurate reflection of the sky. But you said that was impossible. You said, the ceiling will never be the sky, Sally. And I didn't argue, because no matter how old I became, you were always three years older than me. You knew things I didn't know, like there are 88 constellations in the sky and only two, 22 stars in the pack, just enough to spell our names. So we stuck the stars to the ceiling and I spent the rest of my childhood looking up, listening to Kathy tell Sally about all the other things she knew. The sky isn't actually blue. The rain evaporates and goes back up to the sky. And did you know that trees can feel pain, you asked? No, I said but I wasn't surprised. I had suspected as much ever since dad told us that the maple tree outside our bedroom window was nearly dead. It was so old, dad said, it might've been planted by an actual Puritan, a fact that did not impress me as much as it scared me. The tree sat in our lawn, hunched and tangled, and I didn't like looking at it the way I didn't like seeing the bone spurs on dad's feet when he took his socks off at the beach, or the bottom row of yellow teeth that were only visible when mom laughed really hard. It was death, I knew, waiting in the most unexpected places, inside mom's laughter, at the end of dad's toes, in the bright green leaves outside our bedroom window that couldn't have looked more alive. So I pulled down the window shade each night before I crawled into your bed. You never pushed me away then. You liked feeling the soft tips of my fingers braiding a strand of your hair. Well, they can. That's what Billy Barnes told me, you said. He knows things like that. His dad's a florist. Then I was a very good listener, very attentive, the teachers often wrote on my report card. I always had a follow-up question. Who's Billy Barnes, I asked. Who is Billy Barnes, you said, like I was supposed to know. But I didn't know anyone except the people in my first grade class. We were kept hidden away from the older kids, safe in our own private wing of the school. I'm only dancing the football tango with him tomorrow. What's the football tango, I asked. Just some dance the teachers made up to celebrate Thanksgiving, you said. I don't really get it, but who cares? That's not the point. The point was you were in fourth grade and he was in fifth and you shouldn't have been partners, but you were paired up anyway. You were the same exact height. It's fate, you said, and it was. The next morning it happened. You dressed up as a cheerleader and he dressed up as a football player and you tangoed across the gym and he whispered something nice about your hair and that was that. You were in love. But what did he say about your hair? I asked. I was starting to learn that I did not have the right kind of hair. It was nothing like yours which dried straight out of the shower. Mine was curly, hard to control, like one of those evil cartoon trees that pull people in with their branches when they get too close. That's what Rick Stevenson said, what Rick Stevenson said on the bus anyway, just before he told me all about his chinchilla at home, the one that had recently started to eat its own babies. I don't know, you said. Billy didn't specify. After the dance, you started talking to me about Billy all of the time at night, but you never spoke to him at school. What would I even say, you wondered. I was surprised you'd ask me. What did I know about speaking to boys then? I could hardly even speak to my own grandmother and grandfather when they sat on our couch during Christmas. I would quietly pick at the hem of my dress while you asked them questions about their old coal stove and all the milk that used to arrive at their doorstep in bottles. You accepted their gifts with an enthusiasm I couldn't fake. Thank you so much for the make your own bubblegum kit, you said to grandma like you meant it. And I was in disbelief. Were we actually excited about making our own bubblegum? I couldn't even tell. You were so good. A natural dad said once after we watched you play Peter Pan and Peter Pan. But talking to Billy was not as easy for you. He's in fifth grade, you said, and he's going to be a famous basketball player one day. That's what all the teachers say. So you just watched him from afar, paid close attention to him at recess, collected information to bring back to me each night, listed off all the things Billy liked, pepperoni pizza, the Chicago Bulls, praying mantises, and his dad, who had recently broken his neck. It's really tragic, you said. Then you told the story as if you had been at Bill's tree and garden when Billy's dad fell off the ladder. 
He must have fallen 20 feet through the air, Sally. It was crazy. He cracked his spine in two places. Is he going to die? I asked. I couldn't imagine someone breaking their neck and not dying. I imagined Billy's father's neck bent at a right angle. No, you said, he'll be fine. But still, it's really scary. I mean, who knew being a florist was so dangerous? I remember you sounded proud for some reason, like you had broken your own neck. You told me so much about Billy that by the time I actually saw him, it felt surreal. We stepped out of dad's car and onto the parking lot of Bill's tree and garden. And you clutched my arm like you did whenever we saw a fox in the woods. It's Billy Barnes, you whispered. We knew foxes lived here, but we were always surprised to see one in our yard. It was Connecticut, it was the suburbs. We lived one street away from a Dunkin' Donuts. We never expected to be that lucky, to be in the right place at the right time, in the same parking lot where Billy was moving small white trees out of a van. Dad went inside to get marigolds for the mailbox, but we stood quietly by the entrance. We plucked petals off a nearby rose bush, Pretended like we weren't watching him, but we were, of course. We were studying him very closely, though now it's hard to remember much about the moment. All I can picture is his hair, so thick and brown, like it was made of plastic, like he was one of my Fisher Price toys. What are you still doing out here, girls? Dad said when he returned with two pots of gold flowers. The moment was over. Nothing, you said, but we both knew we were guilty of something. We stuffed the red petals into our pockets before dad could see. And you promised me it wasn't stealing because the petals would grow back bigger and brighter like the worms we sometimes cut in the woods. When dad started driving, you pulled a petal out of your pocket and started running it along your bottom lip. It's so soft, you said, handing it to me, feel. I pressed the rose petal to my lip and felt its softness. And that was that. Thank you. And that is that. Good. Well, that was wonderful, Allie. Um, I am very glad to be here. I've known Allie for like 15 years now since grad school. And um, I expected to like this book because I like everything she writes, but I, I wasn't really prepared for how much I, I genuinely love this, this novel. It is, if you haven't read it yet, um, not just profoundly moving and, and sad uh, as you'd expect from the subject matter, but extremely funny and light on its feet so much so that you don't it doesn't feel like it's a heavy thing to read um, as much as it moves at least me uh, it never felt like slogging through grief and trauma it felt like it, it just a beautiful exploration of those subjects um, so if you've not read it I encourage everyone to buy four or five copies of it and, and start tonight um, I want to ask first Ali you uh, that even that little scene here demonstrated how it feels so true to life, the sister relationship, and you grew up with brothers. Um, I was wondering if you adapted your relationship with your brothers to the relationship between Sally and Kathy, or did you draw from experiences with female friends, or was this mostly an act of imagination? Yeah, uh, thanks, Teddy, and uh, I don't know, thank you for saying such nice things about my novel. I expect uh, my friend Teddy to say nice things about my novel, but you know it is always uh, uh, more poignant than than you can imagine. Um, uh, yeah, I you know I feel like people have been very disappointed uh, this week when I've been doing events, and everyone's like, "Oh my God, this is this is like me and my sister," or you know what's your sister like, you know, and I've been like, oh, I don't have a sister, um, and that seems to, to sadden people, but I, I, uh, I don't have a sister. I grew up with two older brothers, um, and I think part of the reason that I wrote this book was basically because I didn't have a sister. Um, you know, I, my brothers were, were pretty great. We had a lot of fun, um, but I was also a reader of books as a kid that were primarily about how awesome it was to have a sister. <laughs> and uh, I became pretty convinced that my life was ruined uh, because I didn't, I didn't have one, um, specifically a twin sister. I needed a twin sister to be happy. That was my, uh, my understanding of things then. So, um, so I think, you know, part of writing this book was really leaning into that fantasy 
um, getting to sort of imagine what it might actually be like to have a sister um, and particularly a sister with whom you feel great intimacy um, and feel like, you know, at least as a kid, <clears throat> you could tell them anything, you know, in the, in the dark of your bedroom, right? Um, and for that specifically, I really did draw on kind of early childhood friendships. I was pretty lucky to have um, some, some, some great girlfriends growing up uh, and uh, a best friend, Sarah. And so, so many of the scenes and sort of the magic that I wanted to recreate was really like the magic of sleeping over at Sarah Laser's house, like in, in the fourth bedroom, you know, the, the lights were out and <clears throat> we would just sort of talk all night, uh, you know, about our day, about who we wanted to be, about funny things, whatever, you know. Um, so, so, I, I, so it was part imagination, part drawing on real life relationships that to me have felt like everything I would have wanted from sisterhood. Yeah. On that note of, of drawing from real life, this started as a memoir, but you decide to write a novel. Um, how far into the memoir did you get and why did you change it? And what, what did writing it as fiction open up for you? Yeah, so yeah, I did. I actually started working on the memoir in graduate school with um, Kathleen Finneran. Uh, our professor. I don't. I don't know if you had her, Teddy. But I did. Yeah. Oh, you did. Okay. Um, yeah. So she was really amazing, and uh, that was my first time ever writing nonfiction. And um, she also wrote a memoir um, about. Well, she wrote a memoir called *The Tenderland* about um, her brother who who died when he was sixteen, and. We just had one of those kind of weird connections where I was like, oh, my brother died when he was 16 and here's my like memoir essay about it. And um, and so she was really wonderful and sort of took me under her wing and was the first person who encouraged me not to, I mean, a lot of people encouraged me to write about that like in my diary and express myself and like, you know, my feelings. Um, but she was really the first person who encouraged me to like try to turn it into art in some way, um, which I didn't previously know was possible. So, so yeah, I started just uh, trying to write down everything I could remember about childhood, about my brother. Um, and the lens that I was sort of using to do that was kind of notes on your sudden disappearance, right? This idea that was the original title of that memoir. Um, just the the, the feeling that I always had uh, as someone who, who lost a brother um, uh, when, when we were teenagers um, of just like wanting to tell your brother <laughs> about the things that have happened uh, after his death, uh, the things that mom and dad said at the funeral, like you wouldn't believe how embarrassing it was, you know, like it, just that feeling of, you know, always having your sibling next to you or sort of in the back seat with you, like the, the solidarity uh, and the memoir was really the kind of repository of all the things I couldn't tell him anymore, but wanted to. Um, so I wrote that and, uh, you know, I would go home, sit at my kitchen counter and my parents were pretty great. You know, they're like, hey, nice to see you. What are you doing? And I was like, oh, I'm writing my memoirs about childhood. Uh, <laughs> can't talk right now, you know, very busy dad. And uh, they were very good art friends, I will say. You know, they would say, good, write, a, write about it all. Just remember that we built you a sandbox once, you know, like don't forget to put that in there. Um, and so I did, and then I just never felt, like I kind of got to the end which was really just the age I was, right? It wasn't a narrative end. It was just like, well, I have run up to my, my present state of being. Um, and that didn't feel like an end to me. Like, you know, some of my favorite memoirs and I think the memoir tradition really is about that narrative arc of, you know, I was like this and now I'm like this, right? Or, you know, I started in poverty and, and now I have great wealth if you're Benjamin Franklin or, uh, you know, I was depressed and I, I have started to 
to find happiness. And, and I was still just sort of 26, like sitting in therapy being like, I really don't think I have any problems, you know? <laughs> like, so I, I just wasn't, I just didn't feel like I had the end for a memoir. Uh, nothing was resolved. And, uh, but I could imagine how things could be resolved for a character who is not me, you know? And I think that's really when it started to move into fiction for me, right? I got really interested in, you know, answers that weren't coming from my own life, but coming from imagination and, and almost maybe what I would want to become, right? Someone who could set forward on a path toward resolving some of the lingering trauma or grief that follows people into their adulthood. Um, so, so that was, that was how it ended up becoming fiction. And, and I just, um, I just kind of found it more fun. I don't know. <laughs> I, I think I'm just a fiction writer at heart and uh, dwelling over the details of my life just kind of bored me over time. And I got excited by all the narrative possibilities that fiction offered. Um, so for instance, uh, you know, the book is very much about what happens after, what happens between Sally and Billy, uh, the, the boy that was mentioned in that opening section uh, after Kathy dies, right? They start to talk, they start, you know, or they start to talk on AIM, if you can consider that talking, I don't know. Um, and feel, they feel a connection, right? Uh, an important connection. Uh, and uh, I had those moments with my brother's friends. You know, I was an eighth grade girl. They were juniors in high school. Uh, very weird to all of a sudden, you know, be this kind of awkward, shy 13 year old girl and have like a high school basketball player like weep on your arm, you know, weep in your arms and be like, uh, what do you feel? You know, tell me, what are your feelings? It was just unreal to me. Uh, and it was both super exciting <laughs> and, you know, like everything I could have dreamed of as a, a, a girl. And, and then of course that is the, it is also the most horrible thing, right? You feel immediately wracked with guilt. Um, just for thinking such a thought. So, so that was really the, the tension that I was interested in exploring that for me in real life, there was no, you know, we talked for a little bit, we went on our own way, lived our lives, became adult people who, who no longer know each other. Um, but that question of what if, right? Like what if Sally and Billy continue to talk? How will that relationship change over time? Uh, is it love? Is it something else? Um, is it healthy? Is it, 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 or is it exactly the kind of thing that Sally needs to let go of? Um, so, so yeah. You, you said you came up with the, the title kind of from the start, right? Notes on your sudden disappearance mm -hmm. was the, almost the first thing. Um, and I, I presume you also had like that second person address from the beginning too, where you were addressing, where Sally was addressing Kathy. Did you find that was challenging and, and really what I want to know is because she's narrating it mm -hmm. retrospectively, was it tricky to sort of make it feel a little teenage-ish in the early sections, but not so teenage-ish? Did you, did you want a consistent voice throughout or did you want the voice to age subtly is what, is what I'm asking. Um, yeah, so yeah, I did have the, the second person from the start um, and I think I, you know, I think I wanted probably a balance or at least a balance over the course of the whole novel. Um, I did want the beginning to feel a little bit more teenagery um, and just really steep the reader in Sally's consciousness at that particular time. Um, but but I, and I also think that that for me was, important. Teenagers can get away with a lot of things that adults can't. And um, I think being sort of 
unable to process her sister's death as a 13 year old, right? Like you can almost forgive a lot of the shallow, silly thoughts that maybe Sally is having at the time that maybe aren't appropriate or, you know, as if it were an adult narrator, we'd say like, <laughs> what are you doing? Or go to therapy or you shouldn't be thinking, you know, uh, but if it's a teenager, I think at least for me as a reader, I think I would be much more forgiving and, and really identify with the kind of confusion that, that a young girl would feel, right? You'd feel both like the cosmic horror of your sister uh, dying and your whole life changing, um, but you'd also feel the trivial concerns of like, oh God, my mom chose Celine Dion for the funeral song, you know, like, that's so embarrassing, mom. right? Like, so you, I just want that balance or that juxtaposition was important to me. Um, and I, because I wanted, as you were saying, like I wanted the book to feel um, sort of light and heavy, almost at the same exact time. Regarding that, um, I think everything you write has at least some humor in it, right? I don't, I, don't, I can't think of anything I've read of yours that is not been somewhat humorous, right? I, <laughs> I, mean, I feel like it's really up to you to decide. Yeah. To but well, what I wonder is, was given, and, and most of it is also about dark or heavy subjects too, but was there a specific, were you trying to avoid, were there any pitfalls you felt you had to sidestep in, in terms of using humor in this kind of story? Um, I, yeah, I, I didn't worry about that too much. You know, I think if you uh, want something to be funny and then worry about it being funny, like it tends to make it hard for things to be funny. I don't know. <laughs> um, I think, but I, I mean, of course I worried about it at some point or really thought about the balance and maybe where a joke might fall flat or where, it's, you know, a certain wry observation might not be necessary or welcome. Um, but I, I don't know, it was important to me that, that there was comedy in it from the start, just because I think, you know, that was my experience of, of grief. Uh, you know, anything intense uh, has the potential to be hilarious. Um, you know, it's, you know, grief is an extreme and I think hilarity is an extreme as well. And so sometimes they just kind of go together or the, the grief and in, in, in its intensity when it's held up against a kind of modern and overly bureaucratic or commercial world starts to become absurd and funny. And, you know, as a kid, <clears throat> I think I was always noting these absurdities that were part of uh, burying a brother and, uh, eating dinner and going to the grocery store after and you know just um and so so that you know there are 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 times in this book where you know I wanted Sally to sort of be faced with the decision of you know well what kind of casket do do we buy Kathy you know like she was kind of high maintenance you know <laughs> like do you actually have to get like the high-end casket? And like, what is a high-end casket? And I have researched it and they're, they're quite high-end actually. Um, or do you get the one on sale, right? And then and, and I, I was astonished to find that, you know, cas of course caskets are on sale, right? Uh, they're expensive and, and people need to get them cheaply, right? But just the idea on sale, right, is just the kind of thing that I was always, like, obsessed with as a teenager, um, and so I don't even know if I would have thought of them as funny at the time. I think at the time that I was experiencing it, I thought it, I felt, I experienced it as a horror, right, like, everyone deserves, or no one, no one, no one deserves a casket on sale, right, like, everyone should get the full price casket, right, but of course you end up buying the one on sale. Uh, so, um, so I don't know, you know, I think I just sort of lean into the absurdity and sometimes that's funny and sometimes it's just horrifying. And I am very bad at predicting 
which ones are going to be funny and, and which ones are going to horrify readers. So you all can write me emails and, and let me know. <laughs> <clears throat> um, so when, when someone dies young, in a sense, they're always frozen at that age they, they died at. Um, since Kathy's older than Sally, though, uh, do you see that as altering Sally's sense of their relationship since she's forever the younger sister, you know, technically, but she's at some point surpasses her in age too. Is there a weird negotiation between that of, of feeling younger, but also older at the same time? Yeah, uh, I, that was, um, that's a good question. I, um, that was part of the reason that I, I wanted to write the book was actually to explore like, <clears throat> the the shifting roles right of this younger sister who really feels like a younger sister right um she's very aware of all the things <clears throat> excuse me that her older sister gets to experience first um and she's envious but i think she's more curious uh and so that really that curiosity becomes the basis for so many of their conversations at night you know what did it feel like to kiss someone or what does it feel like to fall in love or um what do you mean when when you use that word or what you know so she was always asking her sister questions um and one of the astonishing things about growing up and particular in particular growing older than your older sibling for me was um looking back and being able to see them as a child right like they are frozen in time right you know uh kathy in the novel is is frozen at 17 and <clears throat> and my brother will always sort of be frozen in in, in my memory as a 16 year old boy which when i knew him was the oldest thing i could imagine uh you know wow what freedom what power he had you know uh and now it's just like I'm twice his age and I'm so aware of all the things he didn't get to experience and all the things he didn't get to learn. And, um, and so I wanted the rest of the book to really feel like um, Sally growing into the older sister role of reporting uh, to her sister what it's actually like to grow up, you know, what it's actually like to fall in love, what it's like to get a job, what it's like to have dinner as an adult with their parents. Um, and so, and, and I think that change in the relationship, just like everything for Sally is both exciting. Uh, you know, she's excited to tell her sister these things, uh, but also sad and um, a source of, uh, intense guilt, right? That I got to live and experience the wonders of of life, and and you did not, and and so um, so yeah. So I'm going to answer all your questions with a uh, by ending with so yeah. <laughs> just so you know, was there ever a point where you wanted to, you thought about uh, restraining restricting the narrative just to Sally's adolescence and cutting it off at maybe Kathy's age when she died, or did you always know you want to get into her adulthood too? I, yeah, I always knew that I wanted her to get into adulthood. Um, uh, just cause, you know, just as I said, like <clears throat> getting her to that older place was, was really the, um, the, the main drive of the narrative for me. And, and really the, the question that kept bringing me back to the writing, like, what is she going to experience, you know? Uh, what is she? Um, what is she going to experience? What is she going to learn? Uh, and how is she going to tell her sister? Right? You know, like um, particularly as her relationship with Billy uh, continues and strengthens. Right? She she gets to a point where she realizes she knows Billy better than her sister ever did um, because they were sixteen. Right? And 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 they could only know so much about each other in that limited space uh, of adolescence and and Ali uh, and Ali oh god <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sally <laughs> Sally not Ali uh, she <laughs> um, 
she gets to experience adulthood and adult conversations with Billy and uh and if the whole narrative is being directed at her sister right it really changes the way that the story is told and I was interested in that change and what might get left out and what might get emphasized and, and why. I had not noticed the Sally Alley connection, by the way. Honestly, That's neither right. did I until I just... <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Crack the code. I did notice you cleverly gave her the surname of Holt, which is also the name of yeah, your publisher. Yeah, no so. one at Holt actually realized <clears throat> that until my dad pointed it out. Uh, he was like, oh, this is why they published you. Yeah. Subconscious that. influence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the, the book starts in the late 1998. Am I right? Remembering that right? Yes. Yeah. The Union 98. Did you, you know, obviously you were alive back then, but did you have to do any, there's a light touch in the, in the period details, but did you still find yourself doing some research to get the details of, of that era, right? I, um, I didn't do that much re research. I mean, I did research along the lines of, you know, when, almost fact-checking, right? Like when did AIM, when did Instant Messenger become a thing right when did people really start using it uh when did every when did most households have a, a family computer um and it was really tech it was really research related to like what is the mode or what is the technology that people are using at this time to communicate um and so uh so that was more kind of just fact checking and mostly drawn from my experiences of what it was like to <clears throat> to learn how to communicate uh, through so many different um, mediums as a as a teenager, and they kept shifting, right? Like talking to someone on instant messenger is is different than talking to someone on the telephone, which is different than talking to someone on GChat, which is different than emailing someone, which is different than, of course, sitting down at a cafe having a conversation with that person. Um, and uh, yeah, and so I was just interested in the ways that certain modes of communication could um, create a particular kind of intimacy between two people, right? That you can feel really close to someone uh, on instant messenger in 1998, like in the dark of your parents' house at midnight, right? Like you're you feel so close to that person. Uh, and then the next day at school, you pass each other in the hallway and don't say hello, right? Um, I mean, that was, I feel like that was a kind of relationship that everyone was having in 1998, if you were, if you were 14. Uh, and it was both beautiful and like the worst thing ever. Um, and, uh, yeah, so um, so I think really when when we sort of move through time and stop, we stop at particular periods where the something about the communication between Sally and Billy has changed, um, and and the period has a lot to do with that. Um, so my my not yet four year old son has just started asking about death a lot lately. He figured he learned about it. I don't know where. Um, and I, I, I don't know where he's getting it, actually. Oh, yeah, I know. A dog, a family dog died. Oh. So, which is, I think, the, the sort of good way to ease him into it. But he, we, it's hard to know what to say to him. And I think the, the parenting technique is you're supposed to say, talk about invisibility or death as a kind of invisibility and that people just, you can't see them anymore. I was wondering... You, this is called notes in your sudden disappearance, not notes in your sudden death. Can you talk about the difference between death and disappearance, maybe just as you conceive of it, or at least relate to this book? Yeah, uh, I like that question. Um, that, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I had that from the very start, and and one of the first lines that I ever wrote, um, I think in the in the original sort of memoir version. Um, way back when was, um, uh, you know, you died, right? Or it's like one night you died suddenly, right? Um, and, and it was sort of like, poof, Allison, go to church, right? Like just this, it just 
very much to me felt like a person was here, they die in the middle of the night while you're sleeping, and then you wake up and they've disappeared. Um, and, and for my brother, it was a car accident. So, um, you know, it was <clears throat> uh, kind of gruesome enough that, you know, it was, they didn't allow us to see the body. Um, and we, we had a closed casket. And so uh, I just never saw, <laughs> I just never saw what it looked like. Um, and I probably wouldn't have wanted to see what it looked like at the time. But I think, you know, I mean, I really understood as I grew up why people see the body, right? Like in what function that serves um, in sort of forcing you to just look at the reality of, of what happened to this person. Um, so for me, and I probably for anyone who sort of experiences a loss um, that happens afar or happens in darkness or, you know, and you never actually get to see evidence of it, um, it, it does, it, it just felt like a disappearance, right? Um, and, you know, that leaves the door open for a lot of things, you know, psychologically, right? Like you intellectually know that this person is gone, <clears throat> but you you always kind of imagine them walking through the door, right? Or um, you you always imagine them alive and, and never dead. Um, and so, um, so I think, you know, another sort of, I guess, psychological arc for this book is really the transition from, you know, youth to adulthood, but really in terms of the grief, right, seeing her death, her sister's death as a disappearance and really kind of treating it that way. Um, and then over time, learning what it actually means. Uh, to understand that her sister is 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 dead, uh, and to be able to process that and and understand, it. you know, and I think, um, you know, I remember having a very hard time crying about it right after because um, I just didn't, you know, I think it's really hard to understand what it means for someone we know to be dead, <laughs> even if you do see the body, right? You haven't experienced, excuse me, you haven't experienced like the 15 years of, of not having them around, right? And I think it's over time, you know, when the, the time, uh, as the time passes, the amount of time you don't spend with this person, the amount of memories you don't create, right? The amount of milestones in your life that you experience without them, um, it gets sadder, right? it gets sadder and sadder because you're actually learning um, what their death means, right? Uh, and so, um, and so that was a huge revelation to me as an adult, right? Because I always felt guilty, like, why don't I, like, why am I not bawling, <laughs> you know? You know, you're certainly crying because you're shocked and you're confused. Um, but I don't think it was until my late twenties or early thirties when I, I, I actually started to, to truly grieve um, and sort of, process what death actually means. So, um, so, uh, so that's why it's notes on your sudden disappearance. I mean, I did struggle with that title in the last minutes before selling it because I didn't want it to sound like a mystery. And, and I know it probably does. Um, but I don't know. <laughs> so yeah. Um, I guess we should open up to the audience. I can read the, the Q and A's aloud. I guess people can't see it. Um, the first one is, as a child, were you more like Sally or her sister, Kathy? Uh, I, yeah, I mean, I was probably, I was more like Sally. Uh, I- You were like the first person narrator of a novel? Yeah, you <laughs> I mean, who would have thought? Um, yeah, I mean, I was the younger sibling. Uh, I had, I had serious younger sibling probs. Um, just always feeling like your older siblings are moving on without you. And, you know, you can never go to the party that they're going to, or, you know, you can't even, 
um, go downstairs, right? When, when they have friends over, cause you're not cool enough yet, right? Like you gotta stay upstairs until you're cool enough to come down and, and hang out with, with the older kids, right? So, um, so I had uh, a lot of just wanting to be older, wanting to be doing what, what the older sibling was doing. Um, and so really used that kind of as Sally's at least sort of dominant personality trait in the opening when she's seen in relationship to her sister. Um, and then, you know, wanted her to grow from that and actually sort of become her own person. And, uh, and, and you know, I think that's when, when Sally and I start to diverge, right? Um, yeah. I mean, do you feel like the, the adult Sally is just a, more of a, of a true fictional creation and you just felt like you had to go what did you, were you sort of hesitant to make her, you know, a professor at Providence College in Rhode Island? Did you not want to, did you not want to have your own life be too mirrored by hers? Yeah, I mean, I definitely, I definitely didn't. I mean, I actually tried as hard as I could to make this character not me. So uh, this is my, my best attempt. Um, but I, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, what I was saying earlier about why I didn't really write this as a memoir was just because I, uh, I didn't know who the adult Sally was, you know, or like, I didn't know who the kind of adult Al Allison was. Um, and uh, I think, you know, I think it was Anne Sexton who said, you know, my poems are four years ahead of me. And, and I think that's really kind of how I felt about um kind of adult Sally that she was sort of always four years ahead of me right I was always using her as a way to create uh this person who um was doing things that I would never do you know uh, uh thinking things I probably would never think uh, or you know saying things I would never say and also just being able to um address her grief and and put it to bed you know I think as I was writing this I was still in the middle of it so um so she very much felt like a a future me or like an idea of some self that I I would like to become one day the question is <clears throat> were there any other potential titles or did you always stick with this one there were, yeah, there were a ton of titles. Um, uh, one of the other really sort of uh, big titles for me that I, I kept going sort of back and forth between notes uh, on your sudden disappearance and a brief history of everything you missed. Um, and, but I don't know, I just, that one just didn't win out. I, I think I, I wanted to focus on the the, the aspect of, of disappearance sort of versus death that I, I, I just talked about. Um, and uh, it, it didn't really end up having much to do with history or like when I was thinking of the title, A Brief History uh, of Everything You Missed, I was, I was like, oh, maybe she's a historian or you know maybe, maybe there are footnotes and she uh, is cataloging everything in a really, um, analytical or scholarly way. And that just didn't end up being um, the character. And so it just didn't feel as apt for, to me. Yeah. <clears throat> um, once this was fiction, how many revisions did it go through? Once it was fiction? Um, I, I mean, I, I don't know. <laughs> I can say it was like six years. So uh, I mean, I, 50, 100, I mean, so, so many. Um, I really struggled with, I would say I was sort of obsessively trying to perfect this story because this felt like to me, the most personal story I'd ever tell through fiction. Um, and it, I had this horrifying fear that I would waste it, right? Like I would, I would tell the story I always wanted to tell um, the story that felt most deeply intertwined with my experiences of life, but I'd use the wrong plot or so, you know, like I'd, 
or, you know, or, or it'd be that, you know, I don't know. So the fear of it not working as a novel kept me just endlessly going back to it um, in a way that, you know, I can be a perfectionist about writing um, in a, in a very irritating way uh, for myself. Um, but I do always sort of let things go at a certain point. And this one kind of had to be wrenched out of my hands um, from my agent, you know, just so like, here's the hard deadline. You don't give it to us. Like, <laughs> I mean, they didn't actually say that, but that's what it felt like. Yeah. Um, how has your writing process changed between this book and the adults? Um, it's changed a lot. Uh, I think I think a lot more about the story before I start writing it. I don't outline. Um, I don't, tend to write systematically um, or in any real orderly way, but like I do try to conceive of the whole before I uh, get too far into it. You know, I think when I wrote The Adults, I, I wrote that, um, you know, when I was 23, 24, 25, um, before I really published anything. And so, so I was writing, uh, under the belief that no one but my mother would ever read this. Uh, and there's a kind of freedom in that, you know, just go, <laughs> just let it out, so see what comes out and worry about what happens uh, later. Um, and for this book, it, it felt a little bit um, more planned. Um, our old professor, Catherine Davis, um, at Wash U, uh, she said something really helpful to me once that helped me make peace with the fact that I'm not an outliner and probably will never be the person who outlines or puts post-it notes up on the wall. Um, she just used to say like, as long as I can see the shape of the novel, right? Like, is it a braid? Is it a square? Is it a spiral? Uh, and that made a lot of sense to me. Um, and so I really, I know that I can finish something when I can see the shape. And I, and I think for notes, it was a circle, right? This idea that Sally starts um, somewhere and she sort of goes around the world and comes back to the same exact place, but is dramatically different. Uh, and I just kind of wanted to live in, in the space of examining those differences. Um, uh, <clears throat> do you believe the interpretation of your book changes for those of us that are only children? Um, do you mind repeating that? Do you think that changes for... For people who are only children who don't have siblings, I <clears throat> guess, do they... Can they read this book? Are they allowed to? <laughs> Again, not. I feel like that's for <clears throat> the only child to decide. <clears throat> um, yeah, I think I think there's a lot of uh, the only child narrative in this book. Um, she becomes an only child after her sister dies. And I, and I know that's not the same thing as sort of being raised an only child. Um, but, you know, I did have that sense after my brother died. Uh, you know, I have an older brother, Greg, um, but he was in college and he was out of the house. So my house went from being sort of populated with two kids to sort of just me and my grieving parents at the dinner table. And um, I suddenly felt the weight of that they were, I imagine the only child feels to kind of be something for the parents, right? Or, or entertain them or be the mediator or make up for the absence of others um, with your anecdotes or the, the report of what happened at school today, you know? So, um, I mean, only children can, can write in and tell me how accurate that is to their experience. I really don't know, but I do know that there was a kind of profound loneliness um, after my brother died that um, was new to me. Uh, and it, you know, it, so I think, I think, People can probably connect to that if if you sort of grow up in a house sort of by yourself uh, with just your parents. Um, but I don't know. I don't know. Did you ever think about having a third sibling figure here to mirror your own experience? 
No. Um, I mean, I, I thought about it just in the terms of like, you know, should I, should I give this character uh, siblings? But, um, but no, I don't know. I, to me, it was about, um, I wanted the sibling relationship to be sort of intensely focused on, on just these two. And I, and I think if I added a sibling, um, there would have been questions about Sally and her brother or her other sister and how is the death affecting that relationship? Um, and that's an interesting question for someone to answer. I just wasn't interested in answering it in this particular story. Um, I'll ask one last question, which is um, in the acknowledgements, you thank your parents for encouraging you to write about the most painful subjects. Um, and it made me think about the writer's dilemma of wanting to mine your, your own life, but you also want to protect your loved ones. How have you negotiated that, you know, if not in the past, then at least with this novel, what's, what's your approach to, to doing, dealing with that? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely something that I struggled with. Um, and really, the only way I could think about resolving it was just asking them, <laughs> like, uh, hey, do you mind if I write about X, Y, or Z? Um, you know, you know I, it's no secret um, that my, my mother was depressed after my brother passed away. And that affected me a ton as a kid and as an adult. And I found it kept popping up in my writing. Um, and so one day I just had her read a bit of it and asked her if she'd be okay, like having me write about this. Um, and I was very scared to hear her answer uh, and shouldn't have been because she was like, uh, absolutely, of course. Um, you know, I, and I and for some reason that never occurred to me. She was like, people need to know what it's like. And, you know, there's no need that, no need to hide um, the despair and, and the real challenges that, that people face uh, after losing a, a child in the family. Um, and so I was really impressed by her response and, you know, had, I guess, previously thought of it as maybe telling someone else's story and started to think of it more so as just showing what it's like to deal with a certain issue. Um, and, you know, and I think, I think when a child dies, it's such a tragedy that people become scared of it in real life. Um, you know, and I saw the ways that, you know, people began to distance themselves from, from my parents, maybe not intentionally, you know, or maliciously, but just in the way of they were experiencing a nightmare that, that a lot of parents couldn't get close to or couldn't bring themselves to think about. Um, and so, you know, I watched them go through this really difficult thing um, and then also sort of do it alone. <laughs> and, um, and so I think, um, I don't know, I, you know, they just, they've always been really open and honest about it and they've never sort of tried to hide anything they were feeling um, in life and, and just lived out their own emotions as they felt them. Um, and so I think, I think I always knew I had their in, implicit like blessing to do this, but I did check and, um, and, they, and they were cool with it. Um, so, uh, but the, the real surprise to me actually came today when I, you know, I had the launch party for, for the book last night. Um, it was released and it was a wonderful night and my family came together and we were, we were able to talk about, um, yeah, just a very weird experience of, you know, being in the same room with people who, who went to my brother's funeral and we shared this moment of intense grief together. And here we are 16 years later in a room and they're listening to me read about the feelings that I had at that funeral, right? And then they're clapping. <laughs> uh, and it's, and it's, both, it's, all, it's both things. It's both heartwarming and a moment of connection between me and them that I maybe never thought was possible. Um, and then 
you know, I went home and, and for the first time in a few years cried because I, I, th I think I had never really thought like, oh, this is my brother's story too, right? Like he, and he wasn't here and, and he didn't really get to be a part of it. Um, and, and again, that's sort of that survival's, survivor's guilt sort of showing its head again, right? Like here is this thing that I'm really proud of and um, a moment of, of real joy for me. And, you know, and, and I think those moments are always difficult to experience without thinking, but you didn't really get to do that, right? Um, and it, it's really your story, it's your death. Uh, and it's my joy so you know and and so that's that's always going to be painful and that's always going to be with me but um but i i think the solution is to sort of write into that and explore that as a question rather than not talk about it i think that's a good place to wrap up um does stephanie do you need to come back on well i'll come back to say goodbye um, thank you both for, for being here and Allison for sharing your book with us and um, congratulations on what seems like a very difficult book to write. Um, um, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you uh, so much for having me here and, um, and thank you Teddy for all of your questions. Uh, it's really been a pleasure. And hopefully it's not too difficult. I don't know. <laughs> but but thank you. Okay, and you can get um you can get the book on our website. Um, I linked to it in the chat before. And um, congratulations, Allison, and take care, everyone. Bye. Bye. <laughs>